So I'm going to welcome up to the stage Tomáš Gornik, who's the founder and CEO of Better, and also the chair of the Open EHR Foundation. Tomáš. Hi, glad to be here. So we, we were talking a little earlier um, about recovery um, and data and digital for the recovery. I, I wanted to ask you first what your reflection has been on the pandemic and how it has changed our approach to digital and data and how we use it. What are your observations? Yes, so uh, um, I'd like I like to say that uh, you know uh, healthcare is so hard to change. It actually took a pandemic, but definitely it has changed. And uh, the the way we see this is that uh, the uh, the discussions uh, about the importance of data, which we have been trying to um, well facilitate for for years, are now pretty much. Uh, um, a topic uh, at the highest level, uh, even of government, uh, which, um, as all of you in this space know, hasn't been the case. Uh, so, um, usually, what what we see is uh, institutions buying applications, not thinking about data too much. Whereas after the pandemic, because they noticed that without good data, they couldn't make basic decisions, even on things like closing down the country or not, or uh, how quickly something is advancing. Um, and most of, uh, for most of countries, this was a wake-up call. Um, and, and of course, uh, like I said, it was felt at the highest levels. Uh, the politicians who were supposed to make decisions didn't have enough data. So I think, uh, for me, that's the biggest impact uh, in terms of um, IT and, and, and uh, the agenda that we are trying to, to promote, uh, that now we can talk to everybody uh, on this subject and they really understand the importance. Uh, and that's interesting because we certainly... I think there would be a generational shift in the understanding of the importance of data for, for me. I think it's been, uh, you know, 24 months of learning very, very hard lessons. Now, I know in Slovenia, you're actually involved in, in policy development, aren't you, in, in terms of um, digital health. I'm just really interested to know um, what your observations are again around policy and, and how that has changed. Because certainly I've been involved in the UK in policy making and with other countries. Do you think there's an increasing awareness of how policy can support the right thing to happen? Yeah, so so two things happened. Uh, one is that uh, uh, some smart people in, uh, you know, in, in politics, usually there's not many, unfortunately, have, uh, have put together a kind of like a think tank of 30, 40, I think it's even 45 people now from from uh, different parts of the Slovenian society uh, to try to figure out uh, how to move, uh, how to digitize the country much, much quicker. And this is the first time this has happened. I'm not sure if it's part of the, the pandemic response, but I think uh, a lot of it has to do with that. Uh, the second thing is, of course, that at least in Europe, uh, we are seeing a lot of funding coming in. And uh, the worry, of course, is that uh, uh, the the projects or strategies are not ready, and uh, I see now countries scrambling to uh, to put these in place so that they can effectively use the money, which is coming. And it is significant, uh, you know. If we if we say that, uh, or if we know that uh, uh, healthcare um, and healthcare IT has been underfunded in the last ten years, this is now a huge change. Uh, I'm not sure um, elsewhere in the world, but at least in Europe. Uh, we're talking of billions of, of euros uh, specifically for digitizing healthcare. And, uh, uh, you know, we now see projects advancing who have been waiting for funding for four years. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are advancing uh, with the specifications of five years ago. So that's that's another problem. But I think uh, these two, so, so the fact mm -hmm. that... Uh, uh, everybody is now really excited and working on uh, on making sure that this money, or, or trying to make sure that this money is spent wisely, uh, and of course uh, tapping into uh, a larger part of the society to get feedback on what to do. And what are you seeing globally? Because I think there's there's been a, a sort of a, a awakening, certainly in Europe, if not globally, around the importance of getting the the policy right to drive, you know, the correct data for the next generation of digital health solutions? Yeah, it, it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, we, uh, in Europe, I think we, we kind of look up to the, the north of Europe, uh, which, is, which is mostly the, the Nordic countries. Uh, and uh, my theory is that that's, that's because they've been doing uh, or collecting uh, data for, for 20, 25 years. 
what they're now learning is that they need much more standardization, uh, but uh, the, the culture of, of collecting data and uh, doing population health, making decisions based on, on data collected from, uh, from the healthcare system is there. Uh, in, in, as, you, as you go to the south, with, with uh, a few exceptions of uh, Catalonians, we'll hear later, uh, who, who did the right thing years, years ago and is now uh, refreshing uh, the technology. Uh, but if you look at a Germany or, or something like that, you can see how far behind they are in this space. So I think it's really about the countries who have uh, made uh, central decisions based on data and have been collecting this data that are now in the second stage. And the second stage is all about uh, getting more data and standardizing this data, uh, not using proprietary systems to do this. And we see this across the board. Uh, it's it's uh, everywhere from, uh, well, the northern part, uh, UK, of course, uh, but also in other countries. And again, uh, the funding that is coming is, uh, is going to change things dramatically. So, but the countries that are not ready uh, are actually uh, probably going to have a hard time uh, effectively using this money because, uh, you know, uh, unless they have a clear strategy, they will uh, depend on the, on the vendors, on the uh, system integrators. Uh, and it's always a question whether they, uh, they support the open agenda. Uh, sometimes it's not in their business interest, which has been the problem uh, in, in many markets. That's interesting. And you alluded there to the money from Europe. Sadly, the UK won't be getting it because we left. But um, the rest of Europe is going to get really significant money, isn't it, to invest yeah. in digital yeah. health. Can you just talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, just to give you an idea. So Germany is pledging $4 billion. Uh, Euros, uh, a country like Slovenia with two million people, we're getting uh, a billion and a half for for all the recovery, but about a hundred million just for digitizing healthcare, uh, which is huge money in in, in our market. Uh, um, I don't know, Greece four hundred million uh, billions in Spain and in France. So it's definitely significant, uh, and it has been underfunded. Uh, we all know in these markets. Some countries did uh, some smart things years ago. I know Spain was one of them, but this, this money ran out. Uh, so now this next wave of digitalization uh, and the money uh, to support that is going to be critical. And, and the good thing is it's coming. The UK is going to get some money for that as well, I hope. Not from Europe, no. <laughs> well, not from Europe. <laughs> we won't go there, though. Brexit no. is a contentious issue, no. I think. No. Um, I, I, I always find it really interesting, actually, when large amounts of money are actually spent on digital health. It's a bit like refeeding somebody who's been malnourished or whatever. You've got to do it very carefully. What are your views? Do you think more haste, less speed with this? Yeah. I mean, again, uh, some countries have more experience than others. Uh, others are trying to leapfrog. But I think what, uh, at least in the European healthcare systems, what's, what's starting to happen is uh, a lot more centralization. And by that, I don't mean... Uh, necessarily at the national level. The big countries are doing this at the regional level, at city level. But if you think about it, most of your care you get inside your community, which could be the city or, or a region in some cases. And of course, as you go from system uh, to system, your data stays in, in, in those silos. And putting that together has been a challenge uh, everywhere in the world. So what we're now seeing uh, with, uh, with the new approaches is to centralize the data and then build the applications on top of this data and push them out to the institutions instead of the other way around. And I think uh, the examples that uh, we have now in, in, in London and uh, in, in a number of the uh, integrated care systems that are being set up across the UK are going down this direction. Now, the advantage here is, is actually huge because you can centrally control the quality of data, the data models, uh, the terminologies, uh, the amount of data you're collecting. and uh, if you come from the other system, like we set up in, in a number of countries, like, like my home country in Slovenia, where everybody has their own application and then they share some of the data, the problem there is even if you do this effectively initially, as you're trying to upgrade the amount of data and the quality of that data, it takes forever for everybody to, uh, to roll out new systems for the vendors to build them and the hospitals to implement them. It's, it could take three to five years for an update, and that's just unacceptable. So this idea of doing this centrally. Uh, now, some systems, as, as Jordi will tell you later, for, for instance, for primary care, they have a centralized application, uh, which is able to do this, uh, iterate and, and push out functionality, basically, uh, on, a, on a really uh, um, uh, high pace. Uh, but uh, I think more of that is coming, uh, because it's just much more efficient 
And of course, it's much, much easier to coordinate care when you have a single source of truth. Yeah, and that single source of truth is is very important for the coming world of AI and Absolutely. automation and intelligence Absolutely. and everything else we want to do. So um, coming back to Slovenia, um, I really enjoyed the policy work I did in the UK. But, um, you know, it sounds like you've got quite a radical crowd there who are giving a, a very different 360 on on policy. It, what, what kind of talent are they brought in to do this? Yeah, so, so uh, the government set up this... Uh, I don't know. Think Tank Paro is the, is the best is the best example, and um, we have a new minister uh, that came from Uber. He was uh, running policy uh, or lobbying basically for Uber, so he had all these uh, ideas on how to do things uh, really quickly. And uh, quickly, I mean, you know, thirty days, sixty days. Of course, nothing happens in thirty days in the government. So he's now re realizing this as he goes out to ministries, and they say, "Well, for this you need a new law. That's two years for this." Year. But in any case, uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of energy around this. And uh, what happened during the pandemic, actually, is that uh, um, uh, a lot of individuals organized themselves and produced websites which were much better at reporting what's actually going on than the official websites of the government. And this was pro bono. This was uh, some really, really sharp people with uh, AI analytics, uh, a fantastic effort. And it really, uh, well, held a, a mirror to the government uh, on and actually with the government data that they used to do this. So it was um, uh, very inspiring and, and they're continuing to do this, putting pressure on the government uh, uh, to, to actually uh, move. I, I, I like that, the citizen science element of yeah. it and the yeah. transparency that yeah. creates. I think that's, for me, you know, a really fresh take actually on on democratizing data yeah yeah it is and of course you know the more data you can you can give these type of uh, to give to these uh, type of efforts the the more uh, benefit you you can get so so what's this uh, done is uh, it's actually moved the policy on what type of data the government needs to provide in open formats mm -hmm. uh, and uh, usually a lot of this data is available it's just not in the right place and not accessible so how do you facilitate that? Again, uh, you know, it's, we are a small country, so it's a relatively, uh, well, relatively much easier to do this. But uh, we are seeing the same thing. Uh, you know, the ICSs in the UK are organized around two to three million people for, per ICS. So it's basically the same type of uh, uh, volume and, and, and content. And, and above all, the motivations are, are there because, you know, if, if you have a population that is, uh, that is sick, it's, it's the problem of the region. Uh, it's not a national problem, really. Uh, so uh, it's much closer to, to the citizen itself. And, and the way that uh, you build solutions uh, can be much, much closer to the, to the patient. Fantastic. So zooming back out to, to the sort of global picture again, where do you think the really radical things are happening across the globe? Where do you think there's some really interesting things that people can look at in terms of data? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, in terms of data, I mean, there's, if, if we go broader, if we go into digitalization, there's a, a lot of stuff happening now in, uh, in, in crazy places like, like Africa, we, 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 you know, this type of frugal innovation where they don't have anything and they're, they're doing some amazing stuff in, in specific sub, uh, subgroups of, of problems. But if I was saying uh, at, at the national level, uh, obviously I like what, what Jordi's doing, but he's going to talk about that later. Uh, because it's uh, it's a systemic effort at the at the national level, which is uh, so hard to do for anybody that's tried. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, there's pockets of of this stuff uh, almost everywhere. Uh, one thing which stood out for me is when I visited Helsinki, uh, I was blown away because uh, they showed me that uh, about seventy thousand elderly people at the start of the pandemic had a very specific care plan including social health care, personalized for that patient, including who's going to walk the dog uh, during lockdown and stuff like that, who's going to bring the medications to that patient. I mean, it's, it was a, not even patient. It was basically citizen. And I haven't seen that anywhere else. Uh, so that's uh, obviously, you know, ages ahead of uh, any other country, uh, not just joining health and social, but really personalized 
uh, care plans uh, in anticipation of the pandemic, being ready. Uh, as you know, uh, you know everybody else is, uh, is basically uh, catching up. So um, the other thing, one of the projects we're doing is, is relatively simplistic, but it turned out really important for, for COVID, which was the end of life care. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, your information, what you want to be done at the end of life is all over the place. And there's a small chance that it's going to be where it's needed uh, when somebody takes you in an ambulance. Uh, so putting that into a regional context and having it shared between, you know, the ambulance and the ED and the, uh, uh, your GP and, uh, and uh, mental health and uh, community services uh, is relatively a small piece, but I think uh, a, a sign of things to come. Yeah, and, and I love that last example of the, the sort of palliative or end of care pathway because the dignity and respect uh, w we can give to people at end of life is exactly. so important. Unfortunately, again, you know, the COVID uh, exacerbated this problem uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, digital uh, found a way to, to, to alleviate. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And if we thank could you. give uh, Tomas a round of applause, please. Thank you.